two teams coming from different kinds of series. Dallas wins theirs in six against a Clippers team that had some injuries. No Kawhi, obviously, for much of that series, but went a little longer, pretty competitive at points. The Thunder just crushed the Zionless Pelicans, just demolished them. I have a number that will explain that further, but where do you want to start with this series? What to you is your big question, your big interest point? What is your entryway into thinking about Oklahoma City versus Dallas round two? I, I think it's going to be a series that is largely based on because these are two teams that have a lot of interchangeable parts in, how, in terms of how they run their lineups out. They both like to play a little bit faster when possible. So it's going to be cross-matching, switching, turnover creation, leading to fast break stuff. They're two teams that play a, a relatively similar style led by their star creators. That kind of means it's going to be determined by how well those star creators play. So sometimes I think that's a little reductive. Like I don't, I'm not going to look at Minnesota and Denver and say, whoever plays better between Anthony Edwards and Nikola Jokic, that team's going to win the series. I don't think that in that series, but in this one, it does come down to not just the top one player on each team, but can Shea and J-Dub match what Luka and Kyrie are going to do? Because this is going to be, again, an ISO heavy series with targeting defenders and just going to work. Which team can win in that environment better? I think that's gonna gonna tell us a lot. But as far as the margins go, I think one thing to look at is one of OKC's biggest strengths, even to get Shea set up to attack, is forcing a ton of turnovers, and Dallas rarely turns it over. So can that advantage continue for the Thunder when you're already starting to see their three-point shooting slip from what it was in the regular season, a couple different guys? What happens when the Thunder don't have their kind of regular season, we can execute you into a game we can win type of stuff goes away. We know Dallas can win like that because they've, they've been here before. Can the Thunder win against expectation when games and series don't go according to the script that they want it to? And this is, Brendan, I think the intrigue of the Thunder in this playoffs. This is what you want to see. This is the kind of series you want to see this team in. They have not gone through this before. Shea has a ton of, has like a, a higher number than I think I realized number of games on his playoff resume. Lou Dort has played in the playoffs a bunch as well, but J-Dub, Chet, Giddy, to, to a much lesser extent, because he doesn't matter as much. Like any of their guys have not. And Shea's never played as the number one, right? He was a Chris right. Paul co-star and he was a Clipper. What, a Tobias Harris co-star? Is that who would have been the top scorer on that team back then? I think so. Yeah, that's that's a weird thing. That's a weird sense to say out loud. Is Shea Gilles Alexander was at one point a wingman to or a support staff to Tobias Harris? Yeah, it was it was sense. the Harris and Gallinari teams, if I'm remembering right, the Clippers team. Yeah, with Patrick Beverly yeah. and Landry Shamit and whatever else. So probably he's never had to be this sure. guy. He's never had to go toe to toe yeah. with Luka Doncic and and win a close game down the stretch on the road, right? And it's Mark Dagonal's first time coaching in a series like this, and like they weren't really pressed at all in round one. Like, they just weren't. OKC had a defensive rating in the first round of Brennan. This is from NBA.com. I found this stat doing some research for the show. OKC had a defensive rating of 93.5 in their sweep of the Pelicans. That is the lowest mark for any team in a playoff series of the last eight years. They just mollywopped them with defense. I don't think they're going to have that kind of defensive level against Dallas, but can can with Shea, with J dub, with with Dort in the torture chamber, do they have like enough defensive bodies and structure to like at least make the points for Dallas really, really hard? And when and does that to your point, does that help them navigate that side of the ball when it goes off script a little bit? I, I think that is gonna be like a fascinating little little sub battle there between these two teams. Yeah, so the Thunder are twentieth in defensive foul rate. That's one weakness on their team. They play an aggressive style. They're they're dropping in and dipping in to cut off your drives and smack at you and everything else. So they're going to foul in addition to forcing a lot of turnovers. They're sending smaller guys to be low men helping at the rim. So that naturally is going to lead to them having to whack somebody if they can't actually contest or block a shot at the rim. We know the Mavs, especially Luka, 
can really pile up free throws. So I think that's somewhere where you could see the Thunder be a little bit pressed. Both of these teams, especially post-trade deadline when the Mavs got Daniel Gafford, have been very good at-rim defenses. But again, when that's the Thunder, or it went on the Thunder side, when that's not Chet Holmgren, this is the most obvious weakness the Thunder have, right? They don't have that big center at the backup spot. Kenrich Ken Williams or Jalen Williams are going to be in there. But the Mavs have two guys who can play the same role. So if Lively and Gafford are both operating at all cylinders and Kyrie and Luka are, are setting them up and able to kind of break down the defense with their drives, I think those minutes when Chet is off could really be a problem. So I'm kind of leaning Mavs in this series, but my one hangup would be like Jalen Williams has passed every single test that has been thrown at him. Mm -hmm. And the Mavs don't exactly have a ton of athletic wing defenders once you get past Derek Jones. And if PJ Washington can keep it up, include him. I'm not sure if Exum has the physicality and force that you necessarily need to guard those two guys. Josh Green is a little small. If Jalen Williams Kle- can Kle- can go Kleba's toe to toe, yeah, Kleba's is more of yeah. a big on a switch. I know, but situation. but it's like yeah, but it but it's like another body that Dallas I think Averill has relied a lot and be like you would have seen in the switches and you if you're Dallas you're comfortable with that outcome and now if that's Josh Green minutes if that's Exum minutes whomever is filling in that slot you're not as cool with that switch by any stretch of the imagination so I do think like that that's a small thing you're right he's more of a big defender but. Like that's that's yeah. that's gonna matter to some degree on the edges. Yeah, so they'll probably switch less, and that means Shea and J Dub will get to attack more drops, which is what they prefer to do. You won't get to see the Washington Kleba lineups that Jason Kidd liked a lot in that first round. But again, if Jalen Williams can match what Kyrie's doing or even what Luca's doing in some games, this'll be down to the wire every night. I think Um, these teams are very, very evenly matched. And again, they play very similarly. So I think it's going to come down to, yeah, maybe some, maybe one of these teams gets hot on a random night. Neither one of them is a great three point shooting team. Other than that, I do think, again, it's just going to kind of come down to how good can those two star creators on either side be. And that's, I mean, that's kind of, you said Mavs Wolves is is peak playoff basketball. I agree with you. This is in another way, right? And this is just dudes going head to head. Some numbers from the regular season. Both Luka and Kyrie played two games against OKC, one and one in those games. I'm just going to hit you with their averages. Luka, 35, 13 and a half assists, and 10 and a half rebounds. It's pretty good. Kyrie mm-hmm. Irving, 30 and a half points and 10 assists. Mm-hmm. Also, Kyrie, yeah, those games good. are a little weird, though. They, they only I played know. once, once they had Washington and Gafford. I know. And the game at the end of the regular season was well, they, those they guys sat. Play. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. it's a tough yeah. one to tell, right? Because Dallas changed so much after those mm-hmm. trades. And even that first, they played the Thunder the first game after those trades, but both of the new guys came off the bench, whereas now they're both starting. So I think a big thing for me, yeah, the the same guys would have been guarding Kyrie and Luka. That, that, um, that, so that, 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 that was my point. That, that, that was my point. It was like those guys didn't have... Like they they're probably going to be fine navigating, like they're not going to be phased at the very least by the stuff they're going to see as their primary defender in this series. Yeah, for sure. I I think outside of Dort, nobody can guard Luca on OKC's side, and Kyrie maybe a little more, but we know he can kind of find his spots and attack broken defenses pretty well. Yeah, exactly. So, but I I'm what I'm curious about with regard to the other side is how much of a weapon can PJ Washington be to guard. OKC's guys can he do what he did to Harden for instance even though Harden is a little slower a little more methodical or does he become not really an option and then again Dallas is kind of running out of answers for who they're going to throw at Shea and J-Dub if it's only Derek Jones is is really the only one they can count on that's a tough spot to be I am leading Dallas as well I'm just for to be on the record I'm saying Dallas in seven I don't feel great about it could go either way I think this one absolutely I'm going Mavs in six. I think Dallas can I think Dallas will will handle this one. 